Sorry. Oh, you're on my third. Sorry. Uh, yeah, so it's uh, Rod Bober's uh, third lecture. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Too many numbers uh, to forget. Yeah, please. <laughs> Thank you. So, yeah. Sorry to jump in there. <laughs> I'm not even understand what you were talking about. Um, okay, so um, that was the end of lecture two. There was an exercise that was there in green that I, you know, because I was rushing so quickly after Jan's yelling, I, I forgot to sort of emphasise, um, which was, <laughs> um, which was, um, you know, we we had these pictures from the from the Lorentzian signature case, and and I said we get the Einstein cylinder and these anti de Sitter and all those things. So. A little exercise that you can do to finish it off is to actually um, compute in coordinates and see that you literally get those metrics that they use in the literature. Um, and I'm mentioning that now because it's, it's, it's done here, but we're not going to talk about it. Um, so Jarek Kapinski, who's visiting me and comes from GR, you know, I told him this picture and he wanted to just see the coordinates work out. But so, so <coughs> you know, it, it literally produces the usual formula. Um, quite easily, so he, he was very happy with that. So that's a nice exercise, and you know the solutions are here if you if you want to uh, try it. Okay, so lecture three, I've got some background reading. We'll ignore that at the moment. Um, <clears throat> so the plan of the lecture. So we've got, got a sort of little bit to get through, but um, you know there's lots of time. Lorenz probably won't mind a shorter lecture later on. Um, so. <clears throat> um, we, we want to look into this picture that was emerging last time. So we, <coughs> we're using the scale tractor and so on. Um, <coughs> and one of the things that's come up is that you know, we're looking at the zero locus being some sort of hypersurface typically. So we want to understand um, how to treat hypersurfaces um, <coughs> using conformal geometry. You know, so what is the conformal geometry of hypersurfaces? Um, <coughs> then. Um, we want to look at, well, using that information and, and the other things we know to study the, the, the geometry, the link, the geometry at infinity to the sort of bulk geometry, as I was talking about one of the important problems. Um, <coughs> and then the, the applications of all of this to, to boundary problems, scattering, and what's called holography. So we'll just, you know, touch on all those things, so not in great detail. Well, there's detail there, but we won't be able to go into it all. Okay, so just to summarise where we were up to last time, um, <coughs> so, so that should say lecture two now, but so the, the picture that was emerging, so one of the things is if you remember we introduced conformally compact manifolds in a certain way, but now we can understand them instead as being a conformal manifold equipped with some sort of scale tractor. The scale tractor is always given by <coughs> this differential operator that we call the Thomas D, just acting on a sort of a function actually, a density of weight one is what you should use. Um, then the metric that you have on the inside is, is sigma to the minus two of the conformal metric. Um, <coughs> the, the link between the scale tractor, so sigma is recovered to it by contracting in this canonical tractor. Um, and the zero locus of sigma is the boundary. Right? So provided the scalar curvature is, is sort of nowhere vanishing, or this generalized scalar curvature which comes from contracting the scale tractor with itself, <coughs> then the boundary is necessarily um, a hypersurface, so we're in the situation that I'll be talking about in this lecture. So we assume that this I squared is nowhere zero. Of course, if I is parallel and you know things are connected and it's not zero at one point, then that's true everywhere. So that's a special case. That's the Poincaré Einstein type case. In all of these cases, the boundaries are hypersurface, as I say. So that's what we want. Okay, so um, this is just more words from the sponsor. So <coughs> we want to understand the uh, uh, geometry of conformally compact manifolds. So we need to understand hypersurfaces and their embedding invariants. Um, these are important for other reasons, um, you know, things I've mentioned before, um, and also for holography. So <coughs> by holography, I mean that you try to study something like a submanifold by solving some um, interior PDE problem, right? So that so that your <coughs> your geometry is sort of determined by the solution of the PDE. Then, so this is inspired by the by the whole Fifman Graham program and and you know what grew out of it in physics, which is this ADF CFT correspondence. Um, and the, the the moral of the story here, and so perhaps I should put this up, um, which I'm trying to get through, is is that 
In some sense, we can do all of this using this picture with the scale tractor. So you, you think of it, the geometry is actually, instead of starting with a metric, you, you have a conformal manifold <coughs> and equipped with a scale tractor. And that's a sort of another way of thinking what geometry is. And um, <coughs> you'll see that a lot of the things you need to study uh, conformally compact manifolds and, and similar structures just comes automatically from that. We saw that a little bit with the models. You know, it's telling us why you get the structure of the boundary at infinity, the sort of isolated points and not and all that. Um, but it works in the curved case as well, and so that's what we want to... And more, and more. <laughs> it's always more. Okay, so let's go to, to um, hypersurfaces now. So by hypersurfaces, I simply mean um, embedded co-dimension one <coughs> submanifolds. So you can study those completely independent of anything else I'm talking about. You know, why not, right? So they're... They're fundamental structures. <coughs> and um, of course, in Romanian <coughs> geometry, hypersurfaces are sort of well understood classically. So I would, I'm not saying they're easy, but because uh, you know, our sort of mathematical ancestors have done all the work, they're therefore easy, right? So, so we have Gauss, Cadazzi, Ricci, and blah, blah, blah. So you, so you, can, <coughs> you can treat hypersurfaces in Romanian geometry. But when the hypersurface is in conformal geometry, you, you know, you naively immediately have this usual problem that you don't have a connection on the tangent space, and so you need to <coughs> progress some other way. Um, and, you know, the typical ways, well, you can either use a Cartan or tractor connection, or you can use these ideas of holography. There may be other things you could do as well, but those are the sort of obvious ideas. Okay, so we're just going to restrict to hypersurfaces um, that are nowhere null, you know, so at least, the, you know, the co-normal is, is not null, in which case the co-normal um, <coughs> in this conformal sense can be, by having it weighted, can be normalised so it either has length plus or minus one. So we will look at um, <coughs> hypersurfaces like that. That's what we need at the moment. Okay, so recalling um, your basic, you know, hopefully most of you have seen some sort of treatment of hypersurfaces in your or in your undergrad in the Romanian setting or, um, or somewhere. Um, so <coughs> how do you make the second fundamental form? So if you have some hypersurface and N is the co-normal along the hypersurface, what you do is you take the levi sevita connection, differentiate the co-normal sort of tangently to the hypersurface and then restrict it to, the, to tangent vectors from the hypersurface, right? So that, that, <coughs> that gives you a two tensor um, and I'm, I'm calling it here K. So this was Yarek's fault because I was talking about this in a physics place last time and he said they use K. So um, <coughs> I'd usually call it L or 2 or something. But so, <coughs> so that's the second fundamental form. Now that is not conformally invariant. We, we'll be interested in you know, making conformal invariance, for instance, of, of, of hypersurfaces. So that is not conformally invariant, but you can just work out how it transforms under a conformal transformation. So so the levi sevita connection changes and so on, you just calculate. And actually it's not too bad, so here, here's how it transforms. So if you change your metric from the original metric to e to the 2 omega, right, where omega is just a smooth function, then e to the 2 omega is a positive function of course, um, <coughs> then the second fundamental form transforms just exactly in this form by a pure trace term. Right? And here epsilon is d of omega, same epsilon that it turned up. <coughs> and before. Okay, so what, what we find out is, is the um, trace-free part of the second fundamental form um, is actually conformally invariant because that transformed by pure trace. So, so we've discovered some conformal invariant, namely the trace-free part of the second fundamental form. And the, the, this H is the, is the mean curvature and that's just um, you know, roughly the trace of um, the second fundamental form, which you can see I previously called L and didn't change it to K. So <coughs> that should be a K there now. Okay, so this is in dimension D. <coughs> now we learned something else. So um, from here we, we, we got the transformation of the second fundamental form and then the mean curvature is roughly the trace part of that. So we also learned how the mean curvature transforms when we did that calculation, of course. Right? So <coughs> the mean curvature under that same conformal re rescaling just transforms to the mean curvature plus the normal hooked into, into epsilon, right? So this, this derivative of the rescaling factor. So, but <coughs> a, a sort of 
almost trivial but very important observation is we can use that to make this thing called the normal tractor, right? So along your submanifold, which I'm calling sigma, along your hypersurface, you make a tractor by putting zero on the top slot, putting the, the, the co-normal in the middle slot, and just minus the mean curvature in the bottom slot. Now, the hallmark of a tractor is how it transforms under a conformal transformation. You know, the slots feed into each other in a certain way. <coughs> That's the sign of it being invariant. And this, putting them, this minus the mean curvature there, makes this transform in exactly the right way. So this is then a conformally invariant object, actually. Right? So, so this is the normal tractor. And this has been known a long time. Um, <coughs> you know, it's sort of around 1990 or something we made this. So, so... Um, on a hypersurface, you can build this normal tractor. And then that's the, that's the sort of uh, pick in the ice, right? You think, aha, you know, <laughs> now we can start doing a, a, a hypersurface tractor calculus conform in a conformally invariant way. Because we have the tractor connection and so on to differentiate things like that. So let's try that. Let's just differentiate this tangentially using the tractor connection, right? So you, you do the next obvious thing. You, ma you, ma you made an invariant sort of conformal normal along your thing, this normal tractor, so now differentiate it and see what you get. <coughs> and lo and behold, you get something pretty nice. So, so, you know, this might be called the conformal shape operator. This underline here just means I'm differentiating, differentiating only tangentially to the hypersurface, and that nabla means the, um, <coughs> the, the usual normal uh, tractor connection, right? so Cartan connection, if you like. Okay, so... So you just differentiate that normal and, and do the calculation and what comes out, well, zero, the trace-free second fundamental form, and then it's divergence. So that's a nice check because, you know, this is conformally invariant by construction and it's, and it's recovered this um, trace-free second fundamental form that we knew um, <coughs> was a conformal invariant. And it also shows us that... Um, if the trace-free second fundamental form vanishes, then you know this normal tractor will be parallel for the for the tractor connection, um, and that trace-free second fundamental form vanishing is what we call totally umbilic. Right? So, the in, in Romanian signature, um, the second fundamental form is a sort of measure of um, the, the trace-free part is a measure of failing to be spherical, if you like, so or conformally spherical. So, um, if you're sort of conformally spherical in a suitable sense then this normal tractor is parallel. Okay, so, but anyway, that's the sort of start of having a, a um, conformal version of the, of, the, of the Ricci calculus type thing for hypersurfaces. So, for instance, um, the next thing you do when you're do, dealing with, um, or teaching usually, <laughs> um, Romanian hypersurfaces, you look at the Gauss equation, right? So that's one of the most important things. So, um, what you want to do is relate the ambient levy severed connection acting on, on uh, vectors to, to the intrinsic one, right? So, so here V is a section of the tangent bundle to your hypersurface, <coughs> but you, you view the tangent bundle of the hypersurface as living inside the tangent bundle to the manifold along the hypersurface. That should be sort of restricted to sigma there. Um, and so then you can compare these two things. So you can differentiate with the ambient levy severed connection, or you can then differentiate with the intrinsic levy severed connection of the induced Romanian or pseudo-Romanian structure, right? So why not? And the, and the difference, of course, is the other way that you see the second fundamental form coming up. So, you know, via this formula, the set, second fundamental form shows up and it tells you the, the normal part of this, um, of this, you know, ambient levy severed connection severed connection differentiating the vector. So um, if you differentiate this tangent vector field to the submanifold with the ambient levy severed connection, the answer typically is not something again tangential to the surface and the failures by this term. Right? So, so that's called the Gauss formula and the other one thing you see from it is that if you project back into tangent vectors then the intrinsic levy severed connection is just the projection of the ambient levy severed connection and that reminds you of something from the first lecture. What was that? 
So you, you guys are preparing me for teaching next week. <laughs> <laughs> the look of, yeah, it's just, every, it's all there. So remember we had the picture of the earth and we were projecting and I said to you that the <laughs> projected, the projected uh, parallel transport was the parallel transport. So here's the formula proving that. You know, so, so that's exactly what's going on. Okay, now um, we would like to do the same sort of thing with tractors, right? So we have a tractor normal, we have a tractor connection, so now we want a tractor Gauss formula. You want to get started in the same way that you do in your undergrad surfaces course, right? So um, <clears throat> um, now the, the, there's a sort of caveat there because um, what we used here very critically was that the <coughs> tangent bundle just sits nat to the hypersurface just sits naturally in the ta engine, ambient tangent bundle of your manifold, right? So we, you need something like that to have a Gauss formula, how, otherwise how you're going to compare, right? So, um, because you, what will happen, right, so if you have your, you've got your conformal manifold, <coughs> and you've got your sigma, so it will get an induced conformal structure because every metric from the conformal class will induce a metric on here and then when you change them conformally they will change conformally. So you do get an induced conformal structure which means that this, you know, this sub-manifold gets to feel important and have its own tractor connection as well. Right? So it has an intrinsic tractor connection and an, and an intrinsic tractor parallel transport but you want to be able to compare it to the ambient one. That's what the Gauss formula will do. Right? You might worry about low dimensions, <coughs> you know, when in dimension one and two, um, conformal structures don't normally have a Cartan connection, but you get a Merbius structure induced naturally when you have embedded submanifolds. So I won't go into that here, but that's easy fact. Okay, so <coughs> so what we need to know, have a replacement for this, and actually this works, and that's what this result is about. So <coughs> if you look at the um, Standard tractor bundle of the you know on the sub manifold. This is what we call the intrinsic one. <coughs> then it's actually isomorphic to, to the um, the n perp. So n is this normal tractor. There's a there's a uh, metric on your tractor bundle, so you can look at n perp, which is a sub bundle of your ambient tractor bundle, and you get something of the of the of the right rank to be <laughs> to be the um, the um, tractor bundle of the sub-manifold, <coughs> um, but actually it, it works, right? But there's just a sort of slightly non-trivial um, relation. So, <coughs> so, you know, calculating in a general scale of a metric from the conformal class, then, you know, the tractors in n are, are triples like that, but they're triples that are orthogonal to the normal tractor, and you map them to triples um, in this way, and you have to do these adjustments with the mean curvature, and then you exactly get a section of the intrinsic tractor bundle. <coughs> and in particular, if, if you work in what we call a minimal scale, so the mean curvature goes away, then actually the, the things just line up easily. <coughs> Along a sub-manifold, you can always pick a metric from the conformal class so the mean curvature vanishes. That's a sort of easy thing. Uh, yeah. Okay. But then having done that, we can now identify the intrinsic tractor bundle with this, you know, orthogonal to the normal tractor sub-bundle in the ambient tractor bundle <coughs> and um, compare the connections, right? So we have the ambient tractor connection, there it is, NABLA. You apply that to an um, intrinsic tractor or, you know, which you're identifying with a section of NPERP <coughs> and differentiate in a tangential direction, that's what that little pi means, and then you project the result back to tangential tractors or to n perp. That gives you what I'm calling the tilted connection. Actually, I should have changed it back to my usual notation because I usually call it the check connection, <laughs> which would have been very appropriate. But <coughs> anyway, so, um, or perhaps it would have been confusing here. So it's, <laughs> it's the tilted connection. So, um, so you can always make a connection that way using projection operators and so on. So you have an ambient one. You start with something tangential and you project back. So it's easy to see that gives you a connection. And of course, by construction, that's conformally invariant. So this is just orthogonal projection. <coughs> okay, so now you have the, a check connection and you have the ambient connection and you also have the intrinsic connection. So there's actually three things to compare. So here I'm putting a bar over the nabla to mean the intrinsic tractor connection. 
Here's the ambient tractor connection differentiating tangentially. And these two bits here are the tilted or check connection, those two together. So the Gauss formula is the difference between the ambient tractor connection and the checked one, and that is just like in the Romanian case, you get this now tractor shape operator or second fundamental form type object <coughs> um, as the difference, right? And it, but it's all conformally invariant. On the other hand, you still have to compare with the intrinsic tractor connection and another tractor tensor object turns up that we call S. Um, and this is encoding a thing called the Fialkov tensor. So, so, the, so the only real content of this, so this is an invariant thing putting, putting uh, two tensors, if you like, into tractors, this X. The only uh, real content of this is this thing made out of the bile curvature with normals and some second fundamental form and so on. And this is, this is a you know, famous tensor due to Fialkov. Okay, so that just comes out automatically. But now you can compare everything, right? So you, you, you have your sort of all set up with your Gauss formula uh, completely and it's all conformally invariant. Okay, now we um, want to go, okay, so we're experts on conformal submanifolds now. <laughs> Everyone could just go and calculate, you know, you can make invariants and so on um, using those tools. But, so now we want to go back to looking at um, <coughs> conformally compact manifolds and perhaps, perhaps the picture behind that's half hidden here is, is a sort of conformally compact manifold. So, Slide it up so it's more visible. It's, it's really to illustrate something later on. But if it's, yeah, think of that as your conformally compact manifold. You have some metric G plus on here, and this is the infinity. Um, <coughs> with the, you know, we've compactified, we, so it's a manifold with boundary and conformally compact in that sense. Okay, now, um, <coughs> so in that we have a scale tractor. That's how we're understanding conformally compact manifolds, remember. I want to make a restrictive assumption, okay, so I want to assume, we said that we were going to ask that the, the square of the scale tractor, which gives you sort of minus the scalar curvature, <coughs> we were going to ask that that's nowhere vanishing, but in particular I want it to approach plus or minus one as you get to this boundary at infinity. If we're in Romanian signature it has to be plus one, so this slide's not very well written, so you don't have a choice of minus if there is a zero locus. Um, but if you're in other signatures, then it could approach plus or minus one. And if you're in Lorentzian signatures, the possibility, respectively, for those two signs is that you would be um, anti to sitter, asymptotically anti to sitter, um, or to sitter, respectively. Okay. Now this condition of that approaching plus or minus one at the boundary is what in the literature is called asymptotically hyperbolic. So actually, if people are not dealing with you know, full Poincaré Einstein or asymptotically Poincaré Einstein, it's what they usually assume anyway. So they usually should make this, this assumption that, um, <coughs> that, that, that the scalar curvature is normalized so, so that this would happen. They don't say it with tractors. And, and what it means, say, in Romanian signature is it's literally asymptotically hyperbolic. The leading term is that the um, sectional curvature is becoming minus 1. Okay, <clears throat> but let's, let's assume that. And in fact, I want to assume it up to this order, right? So sigma is like a coordinate on the boundary. So, so the zero locus is the boundary, and sigma squared is like saying it's, this is plus or minus one plus sort of x squared, if you like, coming off the boundary <coughs> in terms of sigma. So <clears throat> um, what this proposition is saying is that, um, and I'm using the word beautiful here, um, th this gives a beautiful agreement of the, the normal tractor and the scale tractor. So perhaps I bring this diagram down. I wasn't planning to use it for this bit. So, so in here we have the scale tractor, which is capturing bits of the jets of the scale. Um, but if, if you make this assumption, then when you get to the boundary, <coughs> the scale tractor agrees with the normal tractor, just on the nose. So, um, you know, that it's a sort of efficient package in that sense. So, so that's, you know, one of the first sort of wonderful things that happens, and there's a few, right? So that's what this theorem is saying, basically. So if you have I squared equals plus or minus one up to that order, um, and um, then sigma has to be a smoothly embedded hypersurface, and with n denoting the normal tractor for that sigma, you actually, that just is the scale tractor on the boundary. 
So, <clears throat> yeah. So, so that's good, isn't it? Because, <laughs> it, you know, we, we understand some of the hypersurface geometry from the normal tractor, but the scale tractor becomes the normal tractor. So, um, <clears throat> yeah. Okay, so the proof I'm not going to do fully here, but um, let's, let's just assume um, for the sketch proof that I squared is just equal to plus or minus one. So it's plus some sigma squared that would, wouldn't matter for this calculation. Um, <clears throat> and as usual, you know, sigma's x contracted into the scale tractor. Then <clears throat> along the zero locus of sigma, of course, there is no top slot because sigma is zero. That's where sigma lives. You have the derivative of sigma and you have minus the log pass here. That's the formula for this operator that makes the scale tractor. Okay. Now we're asking that i squared is plus or minus one. So when you use the tractor metric, that zero means that the bottom slot gets, you know, that pairs with the bottom slot, so that goes away. So that so that just becomes the that just becomes the um, this plus or minus one just becomes the um, restriction that the derivative of na of sigma along the boundary um, this gives you a conormal of length plus or minus one, right? <coughs> which is the usual way they say asymptotically hyperbolic and so on. So, so, so n, so this, so this thing in the middle is the unit conormal, and this thing is starting to look like the normal tractor because we have zero in the top slot, the, the unit conormal in the middle slot, and the only thing to check is that this is minus the mean curvature down there. Now, um, that's not immediately obvious, but it's true, and so it's just a little calculation using the fact that you have i squared as plus or minus one at least up to order sigma squared, and then it's forced that this Laplacian on sigma um, gives you the mean curvature in exactly the right way. Okay, now here's a corollary that uh, comes out easily, for instance, as an application of this. So if you have one of these uh, um, almost pseudo-Romanian structures with a scale singularity set, or in other words, one of these conformally, you know, or, or, or one of these conformally compact settings, um, <coughs> that's asymptotically Einstein in the sense that um, I, I squared is going to be plus or minus one, that's the normalization, <coughs> but along the boundary. But the derivative, so if it were Einstein, remember the derivative of the scale tractor is zero, right? Or almost Einstein, that the derivative of that scale tractor is zero. But let me just ask that along the boundary it vanishes. In other words, that the derivative of that is sigma times something. So just to that order, then those two conditions mean that, that we will also get back to i squared being plus or minus 1 plus sigma squared times something. And so the, the scale tractor will agree with the normal tractor. And then this thing will then tell us that the normal tractor is parallel along the boundary. And so you are totally umbilic from the earlier result. Right? Remember we said that if the, if the normal tractor was parallel along the boundary, you're totally umbilic. So in other words, if you're asymptotically Einstein, the boundary is totally umbilic. And it's easy to get it this way. That was a result. You know, like people like the Brun noticed a long time ago, and so on in specific cases. But this is a very easy proof of it. Okay, um, and then if you go, if you ask it to be Einstein to the next order, then actually that Fialkov tensor vanishes, and so on. And in fact, you can build these things that we now call um, higher second fundamental forms. So ask Sam all about those; he's an expert. <laughs> um, <coughs> so, which capture sort of order by order this phenomena of, um, you know, if you're asking it to be Einstein to next order, what that implies. Okay. So <coughs> the, the next thing that was on our list is, is um, scattering and holography. So let me take a breath, and you can all take a breath. Um, right. So he, here's my picture of, 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 say, a conformally compact manifold. And suppose on the interior you want to solve some sort of equation like this. If we're in, in you know, Lorentzian signature or something, this would be a wave operator. Um, or if you're in <coughs> Romanian signature, this is the Laplacian. And this is a typical sort of equation that people use in, in the setting of scattering. Right? So, so you're, you're basically looking for something like eigenfunctions of the Laplacian. So if J is constant, like if this is... If this is um, Poincaré Einstein or, you know, Einstein and some other signature, then that becomes constant, and so you're looking for eigenfunctions of the Laplacian with some numbers there like that. And the, these are the, um, this, I'm putting S, N minus S, because that's, that's literally the notation that people use typically when they're studying this, and S is called the spectral parameter. 
<coughs> okay, so if you're studying that, um, then <coughs> we have to deal with the fact that the boundary is at infinity, um, and if we're thinking of it in this conformal compactification, then it's going to be the zero locus of sigma and so on. But of course, this Laplacian is not well defined, you know, out there because the metric's singular, right? It's not well defined right to the boundary at least. So, you know, so what is the right way to study this? Um, and um, yeah, well, there's a lot of history of this because this is this is exactly what people like. You know, Melrose and um, earlier Matzeo Melrose and so on study um, in their scattering program. <clears throat> okay, so we, we would like to find sort of, for instance, <clears throat> what would be good Dirichlet and Neumann conditions for this sort of problem. Okay, so, um, <clears throat> well, it's going to be linked to what I'm talking about, of course. So, Remember I was saying yesterday that, you know, in, in, in the Romanian setting you have the sort of minimal coupling, so you make the Laplacian out of GAB um, and then some levy seven connections. So you, <coughs> you contract these things together in the obvious way and you make a Laplacian. So this is sort of the obvious use of geometry to determine what we call natural differential operators. But because we're thinking of the, of the geometry as being this MCI package, <clears throat> there's, there's other things that we can do as well, right? So we can, and I'm doing exactly such a thing here, I'm coupling the, the scale tractor to the Thomas D operator. So the Thomas D operator was used to make the scale tractor out of, out of the scale, but now I have something with one tractor index, and, you know, we, we all like Lego, so we just contract these things together, right? So we can get rid of that index by contracting it together. So this, this Thomas D, here, here's a picture of the Thomas D operator, so you know, it has, has one tractor index and we can contract those. Okay, so this would then give us an operator which can act on densities or tractors that are weighted, um, and it would lower the weight by one. Right? So that's what it does. It takes you from track, that, this big, this phi here means any sort of number of tractor indices, maybe there's 43 tractor indices here, and um, some weight. <clears throat> okay, so defining a weight operator, but just <laughs> you can almost ignore that. You know, this this is just detecting the weight of things, right? So, um, <clears throat> so what does this look like? Let's make this operator, right? So, so here's the tractor D operator. It's not that bad. These these are sort of numbers or this weight operator and things. And here's one levi sevita connection and the, and some numbers and a Laplacian thing at the bottom. And then the the scale tractor itself looks like that. And I've written it in that order with the sigma there and so on so that this looks like matrix multiplication. Okay, so the sigma's going to pick up that, blah, blah, blah. You expand it out and you get this, you know, this... <laughs> well, it looks slightly complicated, right? So you think, oh, that was a bad idea because <laughs> it's made a mess of my page, right? Um, but, <clears throat> but actually, it's very good. So, so look at it there. But what happens if we calculate in the scale of, of sigma, right? So... If we use the levi sevita connection that is determined by sigma itself, like away from where sigma is zero, then these derivatives of sigma go away. Okay, so you'd be left with that term and that term and so on, and it actually simplifies a lot. So <coughs> if you calculate in the scale of the metric, <coughs> uh, sigma to the minus uh, two, two of the conformal metric, um <coughs> then... Um, <clears throat> yeah, so I'm, I'm saying, yeah, the jet, ignore the jet plus and minus for, for the moment. So, um, so in, in, in the scale of that metric, that thing just simplifies. And if you use the sigma to trivialize densities, it just becomes exactly that operator that we wanted to study in the scattering. Right? So just, you know, just let, let's say it's a lucky coincidence that it's just actually producing that operator that we want. <laughs> and in particular, if you... If you, if you arrange that the scalar curvature, you know, so if, if, if the scalar curvature happens to satisfy that, that the trace of Skarton is, is, is um, d over 2, so this, this plus or minus is to do with signatures, I think, as I recall. So, um, you know, so this would be like Lorentzian or, um, <coughs> Lorentzian or Romanian signature, but yeah, to some extent it's cluttering, cluttering the notation. Um, then then this thing becomes, uh, i dot d just becomes minus Laplacian plus or minus s 
um, n minus s. So in Ramanian signature, for instance, that's just a plus. And so this is um, the operator that p people are using to do scattering on hyperbolic space and more generally on Poincaré Einstein manifolds. So literally that operator. Okay, um, but so that's where sigma is not zero. So that's in the interior of your manifold. What happens on the boundary? Well, the, the thing is that I said this Laplacian is not defined up to the boundary, but of course I dot D is because because it's using the conformal stuff. So the scale tract is defined everywhere. D is conformally invariant. So this thing's defined right up to the boundary. Um, at the boundary, if 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 the thing is um, asymptotically hyperbolic in that sense that we asked before, then then this I becomes the normal tractor at the boundary, and this picks up actually a famous operator which is called the conformal Roban operator. So that's a conformally invariant, if you like, normal type operator. So Roban means it's a mixture of Neumann and um, Dirichlet type data, but yeah, anyway, it's conformally invariant and I, I think it's better to think of it as a Neumann type operator really, in the sense. Okay, so, th so that's conformally invariant. Um, so that, so altogether this I dot D is, is um, well, what we, we coined a degenerate Laplacian for that reason. So it's Laplacian on the interior, and it becomes first order at the boundary and gives you a, a sort of Neumann operator. Okay, and that's all part of a, a quite interesting picture because actually an SL2 algebra emerges as well. So... Um, so as usual, we'll be in a conformal structure of dimension at least d, uh, with i the scale tractor. Um, <coughs> then you can show that if you compute the commutator of i dot d, this whole you know remember the complicated operator that we had before. Let's let's even just go back and admire it for a minute. So we <laughs> we have this thing down the bottom, right? Which looks remember it made a mess of our page, but on the other hand. Um, its commutator with sigma satisfies this incredibly simple formula. So it just picks up I squared plus D, the dimension, plus two times this weight operator, which detects weight. <coughs> okay, so, so if the scalar curvature is not vanishing, in other words, if I squared is not zero, then you can divide by that, and this actually gives you an SL2 on the nodes, right? So, the, so, so you call sigma X, you call... Uh, y this minus 1 over i squared i dot d. Now this is, <laughs> this is very nonlinear and complicated really, right? But, but <coughs> um, after you've done that, and this is just some weight operator, this, this is just an SL2. So suddenly the page, instead of looking messy, looks very um, clean, I would say. Now that's going to be useful because this y is i dot d. That becomes the scattering operator on the interior. Um, the sigma at the boundary is like a coordinate going off. So if you want to solve asymptotics off, you want to solve things in powers of sigma, <laughs> right? But now we have an SL2, and we can use that to do those computations. <clears throat> okay, so that's, you know, this is now, this, is, this page is the drum roll, right? <laughs> so you want, to, you want to solve this problem on the interior, but you might want to solve asymptotics and work out what the boundary conditions are. So you observe that this operator is actually i dot d on the interior. It's i dot d, and then i dot d extends it to the boundary, right? So, um, so now we can look at the asymptotics of, of solutions of things like that. Okay, so here's what I'm calling asymptotics of the first kind. So, so now just think you're, you're, you're now just looking at this i dot d problem, right? So on here, you have perhaps some boundary data if not, and then you want to extend this off in some way to something to some f so that i dot d of f is zero. And on the interior, if you've done that, <coughs> then you've, you've solved the scattering problem. And because this operator goes to the boundary, it's telling you there you can work out you know, what are the sort of natural conditions to put in there. Okay, so let's do that. So, <coughs> um, so I'm imagining here that we've, we've, we've somehow succeeded up to some order. So suppose um, suppose this thing solves i dot d, there should be an fl there really, um, is order sigma to the l, and then, you, and then you want to go to the next order, right? So this slide's not written very well, unfortunately, but, but <coughs> so, um, so you see down here I'm saying suppose you have that. So you suppose you have y uh, fl equals order x to the l, and you wanted to get to the next term, so you would like to get 
that y f l plus 1 is equal to x to the l plus 1. So you add one more of these terms, <laughs> the term that's not written there, so uh, sigma to the uh, l plus 1 times f sub that, <coughs> and then you hit it with y, but then you can use this sl2, right? So in the sl2, um, the y hits this power of x, so sigma is just x, so, so the y hits at x to the l plus 1, and it produces an x to the l by, by SL2 identities and some numbers, right? And the number in blue is the important one because that one can be 0 or not, right? So provided it's not 0, so remember h is some sort of something to do with the weights, so provided this h naught minus 2 is not equal to l, then you can succeed at that level and go to the next order, right? So you can just keep doing this inductively provided you don't hit that. Right? So if the weight of f originally was something like pi, <laughs> right, so it's non-integer, you're, you're never going to hit zero. Right? But for some integer values of weights, you will, you will hit zero sometimes. Okay, so, <clears throat> okay, so there's a little sub-story here. So, so <clears throat> you do that, and you, it, so you can solve it to all orders just easily using this SL2 machinery um, <clears throat> until, you know, if, if the weight is some sort of integer so that that, that so that L, which is an integer, can be H naught minus 2, then it can go wrong. And then you have YFL um, is equal to YFL plus, plus a term where you add X to the L plus 1, regardless of what you put there. Right? Now, YFL by assumption was X to the L times something, so you can, you can look at the map from the boundary data to X to the minus L YFL, right? because that had an X. <laughs> we were assuming that was X to the L something. You find out that this is actually tangential. It, it, what that means is it doesn't, this map doesn't depend on how f naught's extended off the boundary. So it's some kind of invariant object. Um, and in fact, by a simple induction, you can show that this, this thing here, which is really the obstruction to solving it to the next order, is y to the um, l plus 1 acting on f naught. So this y to the l plus 1 acting on f naught is tangential. So it looks like it involves a lot of transverse derivatives, but it actually doesn't depend on how f naught's extended off the boundary. So it's like a, you know, an interesting miracle happens. <coughs> okay, so when we put in back what y was, this is saying that this operator, which is the power of the psi dot d operator, is tangential. Now if, if this happens, so if you have this l equals h naught, minus 2, you can actually continue the whole thing, but you introduce log terms, right? So this is a standard maneuver. So you can introduce log terms, but <coughs> otherwise this thing's abstracting it. These, these PL plus 1 things, um, if you're in the almost Einstein setting, so you're the Poincare Einstein, then actually um, half of them vanish, so the odd order ones vanish completely, and the, you can just show that, and the even order ones give you on the boundary these you know, famous GJMS operators of Graham, Jean, Jean, Mason, and Starling. So they made them originally in an ambient metric, but this is, this is a way of constructing them directly um, on a Poincaré-Einstein manifold. So they're showing up as obstructions to this problem. <coughs> okay. So what about solution? So that's one type of solution. So we started off with F on the boundary, and we, we tried to solve that problem. Another thing you could do is say, oh, well, what about if I put a power of sigma in front of f and try and solve that, right? So you use this SL2 type business again. Of course, this alpha may not be an integer, so it's not really just SL2 identities, but they're identities that still work. And what you find is that um, you can only, you, you won't be able to get rid of the first term unless alpha is either zero, which is the case we just talked about, or h naught minus one. And when it's h naught minus 1, what happens is that this i dot d operator just commutes with that power of sigma. So that means that <laughs> this thing is then a solution provided, that, you know, it's sigma to the alpha times something, provided that something is a solution but at a different weight. <clears throat> okay, so this is a way of getting second solutions from kind of first ones. And it seems that th this, you know, surprisingly wasn't really observed um, in previous you know, a lot of people have done a lot of these scattering calculations. They haven't really, as far as we know, observed that this is the way the second one arises. But anyway, um, so what you get is you get these two solutions then um, <coughs> in asymptotic form. This is, this is sort of not the case where you need log terms. Um, <coughs> and um, the way I've written them, these have weights and it looks like that. But if you trivialize the density bundles using the interior scale, 
that's how they usually write it in scattering, then you get this expression here. Um, and that's exactly like if you look up Graham Svorsky or Matzeo Melrose and that, you'll see exactly those numbers turning up. But, but sort of discovered in a different way using an initial root calculation and so on. Okay, so this is um, app applying this I.D business. So again, it just came from the geometry directly to, to those sort of problems. Okay, now the thing I want to um, <coughs> finish on, I don't have that many minutes, is um, using holography to, to, to get uh, sub-manifold invariance, right? So what does that mean? Well, remember we had this picture. So I, we said here's a conformal compactification. You have a metric on the interior. Um, <coughs> you, you, you know, this is conformally compact. If you can find this... this um, <laughs> defining function for the boundary R and so that the, you know, the things are conformally related and that metric goes to the boundary and so on, right? So there's another way to say it, say things, which is a variant on that picture. So this time, let me start with just a conformal manifold with boundary. And I want to ask, can I find a metric on the interior within the conformal class that makes the boundary at infinity in the conformally compact way but such that the thing has constant scalar curvature. Right? So phrase it that way. So this is now a, a singular Yamabe problem. right? So re remember the Yamabe problem. You usually have a closed manifold and you ask, is there a, you know, with a metric, say, can I conformally rescale the metric to a constant scalar curvature metric? So now I want to say, <coughs> you know, given a manifold with boundary, can I rescale the metric so the boundary becomes at infinity? in this conformally compact way, but that the thing has constant scalar curvature. All right, why not? Sounds like a good problem. Um, <clears throat> so, of course, you know, an example where it's happened is the Poincaré ball. We, it was <laughs> the, the, the ordinary ball metric was rescaled and that happened, right? Um, <clears throat> now, this, this was studied as a global PDE problem by Leuven and Nuremberg, um, tough, tough people like that, and um, Aviles and McCohen uh, looked at sort of more detailed uh, versions of this and so on. And, and at, a, at a sort of global sense, they, they showed that there are solutions to this, but not, but not knowing the sort of boundary regularity. So an easier question, you know, we're, we're sort of, uh, well, you know, I speak for myself, you know, we're sort of <coughs> wimps in the PDE world. So, so what I can do is look at this thing formally and say, can, can we even formally solve it off the boundary, right? So uh, the answer is no, right? So... <laughs> <clears throat> so can, can you solve this formally, right, as a power series? And this was looked at by Anderson, Crucial and Friedrich in a, in a GR thing. So, <clears throat> um, you know, this is, this is the equivalent of asking I squared equals 1 uh, to hold. Let's say we're in Romanian signature now. We, you can do this in other signatures, but just let's go to Romanian signature. So um, <clears throat> this is the equivalent of I squared equals 1. The scalar curvature equals minus N, N plus 1. So what they showed is that you can solve it up to some order and then there's an obstruction and that obstruction is a conformal <laughs> invariant. Um, <clears throat> they basically showed it was a conformal invariant and in dimension 2, in other words where the boundary has dimension 2, they gave a formula for it. Now it turns out that that invariant that they, that they didn't notice but um, actually when I was talking to Marquis at some stage we observed that, that, that this second order thing is actually the Wilmore um, Invariant, so it's the thing that shows up on the left-hand side of the Wilmore equation. <clears throat> and what what we've shown in the work with Waldron and so on since then is that um, in higher dimensions, this this defines an analog of of the Wilmore <coughs> equation. So this this obstruction is always a conformal invariant and gives you a higher order analog of the Wilmore equation. Now uh, I'm going to go just quickly. So the idea is, you know, we've said all this before, you know, we're, and we're in the setting where we understand metrics is coming from scales. Um, we then get a scale tractor. Um, <coughs> this sans serif d is <laughs> one over the dimension of that one, just to simplify notation. So the scale tractor is then like that, and then <coughs> um, we've already learned that the scalar curvature is related to the length of i squared. So this scalar curvature that we want is the same as I squared equals 1. So that's what we want to solve. So if we're doing just the formal problem, we want to solve formally this thing I call the conformal Iconal equation. So in other words, that, that this, um, this Thomas D on sigma, when you square it, gives 1. All right. So 
Um, <coughs> now that's nonlinear, so we, we observed in the scattering picture that we could use the SL2 to solve the linear type problems, but this one's nonlinear, so at first you might think it's, it's not going to work, but really to cut a long story short, it does still work. <laughs> so you can still use the SL2 to solve this problem formally, right? So, so you, you set this up and you want to solve I squared equals one uh, to as high order as possible, you use this SL2, and then <coughs> these SL2 identities, right? And then basically this is the same sort of argument that we used in the scattering case. So you imagine that you've solved it up to some order, um, <coughs> so, you, so you know that D of sigma is um, squares to give one plus sigma to the K, and you want to go to the next order. So you take sigma prime to be sigma plus sigma to the K plus one times something, and then see if you can do it, right? So you just square that thing, you expand it out, the d sigma gives you the original i, and so <coughs> you get some very sort of high, high order nonlinear thing here, because it's quadratic um, in, in the segments. That actually does turn out to be higher order, that's actually the most difficult part of this calculation. And then, so you can ignore that, and then you get this i dot d showing up again. So then you can just solve it using the SL2 identities, right? So. Um, so you can see that provided k is not equal to n plus 1, you can go to the next order. And when k equals n plus 1, um, you can't, but that's where an invariant shows up. That's the hallmark of, of something being there. And that, that leads to the theorem. So basically, <coughs> this is you know, our way of getting the ACF result. And then we really showed that this was a natural invariant and so on. And we showed that the subtraction generalizes the Wilmore and that it has this leading term Laplacian bar to the n over 2 acting on the mean curvature. So in the Wilmore, you know, there's just one Laplacian there. So in higher even dimensions, boundaries, this is, this is a conformal invariant that generalizes that. So you get this very nice thing that, um, you know, so here, here's an interesting problem for those of you who, who, who do more analysis. So if you have a closed manifold, and you can solve this singular Yamabe problem, but in such a way that you do get a zero locus, then that zero locus is automatically a Wilmore or higher Wilmore, right? So if you're in dimension three, then that literally has to be a, a Wilmore surface separating it. And, and in higher dimensions, it, it um, is one of these higher Wilmores. Okay, um, <laughs> so just the last comments. So the, uh, this subtraction thing, there's an action for it, and it turns out to come from renormalized volume. That's what this picture is. So these asymptotically... Um, hyperbolic manifolds and so on are infinite volume, but you can cut them off at epsilon away from the boundary and they have finite volume, and then you ask how does the volume depend on epsilon? You get one of these Lorentz series type expansions. The coefficient of the log term is called the conformal anomaly. Um, <coughs> Graham showed that if you solve this um, singularly Marby problem approximately up to the order that we, we showed you can and so on, then, then this thing provides an action for this, um, for this thing. So this provides an action for these higher Wilmores. And we, we could recover it as well. Around, you know, after, after he told us his tricks, we could turn it into our language and solve it as well. And, and we got some more. So it's linked to sort of Q curvature and all sorts of things. Um, anyway, so this is the last page. So just to say that then what the idea is that... Um, yeah, so what, what's the sort of... A motivation for doing this apart from discovering the higher Wilmore is suppose suppose you just have some some manifold like this, right? So you think of it, you want to find conformal invariants of, of a hypersurface. So what you can do if it's a if it's a hypersurface, just suppose this is a conformal manifold with boundary, right? You want to know what are the what are the conformal invariants of the boundary. So what you can do is try and solve the singular Yamabe problem off, and, and then all of the invariants of that singular Marby structure up to the order that they're unique will be invariants of your embedding. Right? That's the holographic idea. <coughs> and so, so you, can, you can get all invariants of, of your hypersurface up to that order just by studying invariants of the, of the, of the singular Yamabe metric structure that you get. <coughs> um, and then as an application of this uh, with Sam Blitz and Andrew Waldron, we showed, for instance, that you can produce these higher fundamental forms, um, the trace-free second fundamental forms, the first one, then Fialkov, and so on. Um, <coughs> and these give order by order if and only if conditions for, for a manifold to actually be asymptotically Poincaré-Einstein, that order. 
Okay, <laughs> that's enough already. Do you have one question for Rob? Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, I, I was wondering, um, is there, as I understand, the whole tractor technology used is, is equivalent to the normal conformal Correct. Yep. geometry? Is there, in your estimation, is there anything interesting that survives if you use non-normal geometry? Is there a distortion or something? Are you talking about conformal or...? Yeah, for conformal, yeah. Conform, Non-normal conformal geometries. Because in, in the way you define geometries, it's M class geometry plus the parallel tractor. Yeah, yeah. And, and so non-normal... Mo most of the ideas I'm stuff. using would work in non-normal. I mean, okay. basically, the, for instance, the whole curved orbit machinery is just using a Cartan connection. There's nothing about normal in it. Yeah. yeah. So, so, yeah, the short answer is, yeah, yeah. But it depends how natural you, you know, <laughs> depends how natural it is. So it may be not normal, but for a natural reason, you know. <laughs> so you may have some, some other structure, say, like a complex structure or something that you're trying to preserve um, that, that takes you into the non-normal realm, but you still get something unique then. Yeah, so long as it's truly kind of determined by the geometry you want to study, then you'll get good things, yeah. yeah. But, but certainly the sort of, the, the moral of the story is really coming from this curved orbit machinery, and then it, and then it, it generalizes beyond um, needing parallel. And that happens in other settings, so, you know, the projected settings and so on, the results of the flood and so on. Um, so, um, I, I expect that happens a lot, but it, it's quite a hard problem to sort of quantify what you mean by a lot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so let's thank Rod for his three lectures.